Moving on for our next special address, four billion years of innovation in the history of life. We are honoured to have with us Professor Neil Shubin, Robert Bensley Distinguished Service Professor and Associate Dean, Biological Sciences Division, University of Chicago. To introduce him, please welcome Nick Marion, Nick Ahmad Kamal, Senior Vice President of Investments, Kazana. Marion, over to you. Thanks, Ramira. Greetings. I'm Nick Marion, Nick Kamal. To continue our conversation on interconnectedness, I am honoured to introduce Professor Neil Chubin, who will be speaking about innovation. I am not talking about Teslas or Impossible Burgers. Instead, Neil will be taking us through four billion years of innovation in the history of life. Neil Chubin is a Robert Bensley Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago and Associate Dean for Academic Strategy of the University's Biological Sciences Division. Neil's research focuses on the evolution of new organs, and he leads a laboratory that combines expeditionary paleontology and molecular biology to understand major transformations in the history of life. He is the author of three books, most recently, Some Assembly Required. Neil's first book, Your Inner Fish, A Journey into the Three and a Half Billion Year History of the Human Body, was named the best book of the year by the National Academy of Sciences and was developed as a mini-series for PBS, which won an Emmy in 2016. Without further ado, over to you, Professor Neil. Thank you, Marion, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Greetings from Chicago, Illinois, where it's in the evening. Um, I am an evolutionary biologist, a paleontologist, as you heard, and I study the history of life. And I study the great transformations in the history of life. And what we're going to do today is to look at those, some of those great transformations, to look at evolution, and ask the question, what can we learn about innovation from the history of life on the planet? So let me share my slides and just go through um, some introductory material here. And I'm going to start by showing you this line. So what you see in front of you is a, just a timeline of the history of the Earth. It starts about 5 billion years ago on the left and goes to today all the way on the right. Okay, so that's a timeline of the different geological epochs. Now, the reason why I put this here is when you look at the history of our planet and when you look at the history of life, what you see are great transformations that have happened. So the planet was formed about 4.57 billion years ago. And then you had the origin of life around 4 billion years ago. That's B, billion with a B. It's a long time ago. Um, and then if you go more towards the recent, all the way on the right, what you start to see are the great transformations that shaped our own world. You find the first shellfish, the first fishes, the first plants, the first dinosaurs, mammals, and on and on and on until you get just to the tip of that change, the first humans. The first thing I want to show you about this is just look at this human history. All of human history is just a tiny sliver of time on the right-hand slide of this timeline. Most of the history of our planet, most of the history of life is a history without us. In fact, it's a history without you know, animals in general. Animals are recent, um, uh, recent denizens of, of our planet. All these great transformations happened recently. So what I want to do today um, is to really ask the question, innovation and evolution. What can four billion years of biological invention teach us? Can teach us about today? Are there lessons? And so I'm going to try to extract a few, and I'll look forward to hearing your questions, and maybe we can have a conversation about the number. Let me begin with the great transformation that I work on in my own scientific research. And that is, I, I ask the question, you know, how are structures repurposed? How do we find new uses for old inventions? And I'm going to give you an example of how much of evolution is really redeploying inventions to new places. That is, much of evolution is not, is not inventing new things, but using old things in new ways. And you're going to find this in that unlikely place. This is the great transition that I study. This has been what I've been you know, part of my research for the last, uh, the last 35 years, actually. What you see is a fish on top. This is a, a cartoon of a, of a fossil fish on top. And you see a cartoon on the bottom of one of the first creatures to walk on land. This is the great transformation from life in water on top to life on land on the bottom. Now, for billions of years, all life was in the sea. And we know this because of the fossil record. 
Then about 365 million years ago, we find creatures like the one on the bottom, the first creatures to walk on land. Now I study this because if you look at it, it seems so utterly impossible. You know, how did fish evolve to walk on land? I mean, think of all the things that have to change. You know, fish live in water. They, they, they excrete in water, feed in water, reproduce in water, move about in water. Whereas land living creatures, you know, they walk about and they have to deal with gravity. They have to deal with all kinds of stresses on land. Everything had to change. So my quest as a scientist, when I was beginning my career, was really to think about, you know, how do we find fossil evidence that tells us about how this great transformation happened? So if you look at the fish on top and you compare it to the land living creature on the bottom, they look very different, right? Look at that, the shape of the head. The, the fish on top has a conical head with eyes on either side. The land living animal on the bottom has a flat head with eyes on top. The fish on top has no neck. Look, see the head is connected to the shoulder just by bones. Fish don't have necks. They can't swivel their head independently of their body. The creature on the bottom, the earliest land living animals, from rocks about 365 million years old, have a head that can swivel independently of the body. And of course, fish have fins, right? And creatures that walk on land have limbs with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles. So what I wanted to do was to find places in the world that had intermediates that could tell us about how this change happened. That maybe we'd find, if we knew how to look, maybe we'd find a flat-headed fish with fins, with arm bones inside. You know, something intermediate that can tell us about how this change happened. So what I did is working with colleagues, and what I do is a real team sport because, you know, I run paleontological expeditions, and that really is leading teams, and I've been very fortunate to work with fabulous teams of people uh, in, on all seven continents on, on planet Earth. Most of my research has been in Earth's polar regions, and the reason for that is what you do is if you're looking for fossils like this, if you're in my business, you ask the question, you know, where in the world can I find that fossil intermediate? Well, what you want are places in the world that have the right rocks to hold these fossils. That means those rocks are the right age to hold the fossils. So remember I told you this land living creature on the bottom is from rocks about 365 million years old. The fish on top, I didn't tell you how old that was, but that's a fossil from about 390 million years old. So you want to be in that window of time between 390 and 365. So you want rocks of the right age. Unfortunately, we have maps that show us that around the world. But we also want rocks of the right type to hold fossils. Not every kind of rock does that. And so that's why you know, much of my work is studying geology, honestly, and, and, and learning the kinds of rocks that, that, that could hold fossils and, and how they develop. It turned out the absolute best place for us to look was up in the Canadian Arctic, where that arrow is, look at the top, um, about 600 miles from the North Pole. And the reason for that is, and I'm going to show you a map here that shows kind of what we're looking for. Um, this is a map of the Canadian Arctic. And if you look in the upper left, what you'll see is where we're at, circled in red, is what's called Nunavut Territory. It's the northernmost province or territory of Canada. If you zoom into that and look at the main body of the slide here, what you see are the islands of Arctic Canada, again, about 600 miles from the North Pole. And then circled in red here are where rocks of the right age, rocks about 375 million years old, and rocks that are sort of the perfect kinds of rocks to hold fossils where they're exposed. So the quest for my team over a period of about six years was to look at these rocks and to see if we can find fossils that tell us about how this great transformation in the history of life happened. Now it was a quest that actually began in the Western part of the Arctic on the left, and then ultimately led us to the Eastern part of the Arctic on the right. But just to give you a sense of how we work, this is one of our camps from the year 2000. We started this, this, uh, this hunt in 1999. This is one of our camps in, in 2000. It's very rustic, okay? So this is, this is about as basic as you can get. What we set up is a small team of about six people, each in our own sort of mountaineering tents, because the winds are very high here. This is, um, this is actually a pretty forbidding place to be. Uh, we have a kitchen tent where we do a lot of the science and a lot of the specimens we recover, uh, we study in the, in, the, in the main tent here. But look in the distance. When you see in the distance here, these cliffs, they're not really cliffs because you can scramble up and down them. Um, these, are, these are rocks of what's called Devonian age. These are rocks that are about 375 million years old that were formed in ancient rivers and streams. And so what we do is each day we'd get up and we'd get out on these rocks and look for places in these rocks where bones or fossils might be weathering out on the surface. So we look on the surface and we'll find them. And that's, and believe it or not, that's how we find these things. And then once we find them on the surface, then we dig in. 
Well, we got really, you know, we worked pretty hard over six years, but then in one year we got kind of lucky. Uh, we found a place right here. So look in the middle of the slide. You can sort of see a hole right there, right in the middle. That is a place where we had thousands and thousands and thousands of fossil fish bones coming out of rocks. And so what you see is we dug a big hole. <clears throat> and then, um, and in that hole, what we found is that um, there was a layer of rock that had skeleton after skeleton of fossil fish piled one on top of the other. So we started to remove these. And then everything in my life changed one day in 2004 after six years of hunting. We're working that layer. We're trying to, and we're seeing bones. And a colleague showed me this. Now, it's going to look like nothing to you, but it's actually really, really important. What you're seeing is the first view of one of the most important fossils we discovered. <clears throat> and it's right in the front here. Now, what you have to do is when you realize that we've trained our eyes over about six years to find fossils in these rocks. And the fossils are the same color as the rocks. So you can't use color as a guide. It's, everything's going to be muddy brown. What you need to do is look for shape. And if you look at the front of this, what you'll see is there's a different shape here. It looks like there's two rods in the rock. There's like a V here, and I'll point to it right there, like a V right there. As soon as I saw that, I knew we had found what we were looking for. Because what we have here are two jaws upside down, and then there's some teeth right here, which you can't see, but I'll show them to you in a second. And there's a snout underneath it. I knew that this is what we were looking for. It wasn't, it was a fish, but it was from a fish that had a flat head. Remember I showed you that those early limbed animals had flat heads? I had a flat headed fish staring right at me here. It was really amazing. Anyway, so um, we brought this, so we, we ended up etching it out, covering it with plaster to bring it back to the lab on its, you know, 3,000 mile trip south to Chicago. Um, and uh, then we since found 20 more of these, not that year, but over, we returned a number of years. Now, let me show you what happened to the specimen and why it's important and why it helps us think about innovation, because we're going to be returning to that. We brought it back to the lab. And then the rock is removed grain by grain by somebody who is incredibly patient, even more patient than I, uh, and removes the rock grain by grain. You can see his tool here. It's a, it works under a microscope with this needle and a pin vise removing the rock. And the rock can separate from the fossil. Look at this. Doesn't it look like, look at this, what's exposed here. Looks like it's the top of a head, right? And you see one eye hole pulled in orbit and another eye hole. Look what happened after another five months. Boom. Look, it has a flat head, eyes on top. There's one shoulder, there's another. Wow, it looks like this thing even might have a neck. So this thing was emerging over time. So remember, we were looking for a fossil intermediate, maybe a flat-headed fish with fins, with arm bones inside, um, maybe with a neck. Um, and we were looking for rocks of the right age, and we were looking at rocks of the right type. And this is, this is that specimen I showed you before with that little bee. This is it right here. Now, it's a creature about four feet long. So if I was to hold it in front of you right now, It'd be about four feet long. The head, um, or you know, say um, a little more than a meter long, <clears throat> and it um, it would look like a fish in some ways. That it has scales in its back. You can see the scales here; they're sort of squashed in, and it has fins with fin webbing. You can see the fins right there. It also has um, fish-like texture to the bones, and there's lots of other fish characteristics here. But like a land-living animal of the time, it had a flat head with eyes on top. It had a neck. And guess what? When we cracked open the fin, what did we find? We found bones that correspond to our upper arm, forearm, even parts of our wrists. This is a fish that has a fin with arm bones inside it, has a neck, and has a flat head. So to give you a sense of what's, what's going on here, um, this is the fin. I can, I can spend all day showing you this thing. It's beautiful. It's got a humerus, which is an upper arm bone like ours, has a radius and ulna, two bones here, like a radius and ulna then wrist bones. We can even scan inside and begin to see where blood vessels would be and so forth. But what's really important is we can begin to take this thing apart using CT scanning and we can look to see the joints inside. So look to the left and what you see are the joints. And what's amazing here is this is a fish with a shoulder. So here's the socket for the shoulder on the upper left. There's the ball on the humerus on top. So that's the shoulder in A. Look at B. This is the elbow. This is a fish with an elbow for the what's called the radius and ulna humerus. And then there are two wrist joints, which compare very favorably to the wrist joints in, um, in uh, amphibians. So there's a fish with fins with uh, arm bones inside. So this fish lived in water. Um, it had arm bones inside, had a neck. In fact, this fish already had many of the traits necessary to walk on land, but it was still a fish. Did it have lungs? Well, we don't know, but we, have a, we know for sure that the fish had lungs. Check this out. If you ask the question, do fish have lungs? The answer is a definitive yes. 
In fact, fish have lungs primitively. This is a fish, this is a fish from Australia. It's called the Australian lungfish. If you look at it, it has cousins that live uh, in Africa and others that live in South America. Um, it breathes air. It has gills, but when the oxygen content of the water gets low, it goes up to the surface of the water and gulps air. And if you look at how it was able to do that, it has a paired set of lungs. And it has a paired set of lungs that have the same structure and lobes as our own lungs. And indeed, the genes that make this, um, that build this in development are similar to our genes. So this lung is equivalent to our lung. And this fish is just not just a one-off. If you, if you look at the evolution of lungs in the you know, history of life using DNA and fossils and so forth, what you see is this. This is a tree of life. On the right, what you see are limbed animals like us, amphibians, and so forth. And these are all the fish that you see in the fossil record. If you look to see, and I'm colored in green here, which of these creatures have lungs, what you'll find is lungs aren't some advanced trait that, uh, that came about as creatures walked on land. No, fish had lungs for eons before animals took their first steps on land. Um, and what does this tell us? This tells us about repurposing, because what we have is in the invasion of land, not many features had to be invented. We had fish that had arm bones. We had fish that had wrists. We had fish that had shoulders. They had, um, they had um, necks. They had lungs. All the inventions that were necessary to walk on, to move on land, actually came about while fish were still living in water. So the big, big change, the big revolution in life is not, and does not necessarily involve the origin of new structures, although there's some of that. Most of it is repurposing, using old structures in new ways, finding new uses for old things. So in my first bullet up top, repurposing, finding new uses for old inventions, lungs and all these things and, and, and limbs were old inventions that, were, that, were, that came about in water. They were redeployed um, into a new place, which is in land. And by the way, this is just, isn't just a one-off in the history of life. We see this in every transformation. If you think about feathers and birds, bird feathers didn't arise as birds evolved to fly. Feathers arose in dinosaurs that were used originally for thermoregulation. So again, like over and over again, repurposing. That's sort of one of the main themes we see in innovation evolution, redeploying ancient inventions to new places. The other is we find in, in, in the history of life, sometimes small changes can leverage really big impacts. And let me give you one story from the 1800s, which sure paints this picture. Then we'll talk a little bit about DNA. Auguste de Muriel was a, the keeper of reptiles in Paris in the 1800s, around the time of Charles Darwin. And he was very fortunate because he worked in Paris at a time when expeditions were coming back from around the world with new kinds of creatures. And he had the privilege to, you know, of, of describing them for the first time. So a team uh, uh, that was working in Mexico, near Mexico City, actually, came back and brought Dumarillo from their expedition to Mexico, came back and brought him these salamanders, the salamander right here. And they did it because they thought Dumarillo would be interested in it because Charles Darwin just came out with his theory of evolution and they saw this thing and they said, look, it has gills, it looks aquatic, maybe it's a creature that could tell you a lot about how how fish evolved the wall. Well, Dumarillo wasn't particularly interested in that. So what he did is he took the, there were six of them. So he took these, put them in a box and just kept them in his menagerie. He came back about ooh, eight months later and he was in for a big surprise because he found his original salamanders in there, but then he found these in there as well. A whole new type of salamander in his box appeared in eight months. And he was thinking, well, what, what kind of magic is going on in this box? I mean, because this is a totally different salamander. It doesn't have external gills like the ones on top. Uh, its tail's very different. It's clearly a very terrestrial animal. Um, so he studied the development. Guess what he found? Small changes mean a lot. Check this out. So when he studied the development of these things, what he found is that the eggs hatch into these larvae, which you see here, and they have external gills, and they have um, um, an aquatic tail. Well, it turns out there are two ways that these things can develop based on what hormones they secrete. They can actually stay like the shape of the larvae and just grow bigger, like the one you see on the bottom here, or they can metamorphose because they secrete a thyroid hormone and lose the gills and have a new form of tail. This simple switch between these two very different kinds of salamanders happens because of a hormonal secretion, thyroid hormone, and that one hormone can change the entire body. So you can get huge leaps and huge changes with a simple change. So these, these tiny changes, which leverage a lot of other changes, can uh, be very important for innovation.
And we see this in DNA. <clears throat> now, every cell of our body has DNA inside it. A six foot strand, six foot long strand. Think about that. In every, in all 20 trillion cells of our bodies, we have a six foot long strand of DNA packed inside the nucleus. So if you stretched it from end to end, it would go from here to Pluto, your own DNA, if you just unwound it and from every cell. That's amazing. Now we've gone to, we now understand a lot of DNA, uh, a lot about DNA. And much of what we know about DNA was based on studies of fruit flies of people studying mutations in fruit flies. And there's some mutations that were uh, small changes can leverage a lot, check this out. So this is a normal fly, it's a normal head of a fly, right? So you can see in red, that's the eye, right? And then you can see where it's labeled here, the antennae. Well, there are some crazy mutations out there, check this one out. There are some mutations where legs will form where the um, uh, where uh, antenna used to be, where you develop the right organ, but in the wrong place. So there are certain genes in the fly that control where organs develop. Simple genes, a simple mutation can, can bring about that change. And so what developmental biologists did over the last oh, 30 years is they've mapped these genes and they can show, here's a fly embryo you see in the middle here. And then you see an adult fly on the bottom. They mapped where these genes are turned on and you can see in, in the color coding where these genes are turned on and they control where they're turned on, where whether you develop a wing or a leg or an antenna or what have you. Well, the take home message is here, small changes in these genes can leverage a lot. But importantly, um, we have these genes too. Versions of these genes are seen in our own embryos being turned on and off, making our own body plan. So we have the body plan. Our body plan is formed by a molecular and genetic toolkit that, is, uh, uh, that we originally found in flies. So we share a genetic history with all life on the earth, but you can see it beautifully when you see how, how DNA builds bodies and how small changes in that DNA can change the body of a fly. And indeed small changes in that DNA in us can change our backbone, can change our limbs and so forth. So again, small changes can leverage a lot. One other point I wanna talk about is that diversity can bring innovation. And, it, and, and what that means is in, in, in evolution, the more experiments and failure there is, the faster evolution can go. So this is uh, clones, right? These are two clones. We don't reproduce by cloning, which is a good thing, because if we re reproduced by cloning, we would all look alike. I don't know if we'd look like this, but we'd all look alike. Now, if that happened in animals, that would be a disaster. When if, if reproduction happens by cloning, it does happen rarely, but when, if it happened commonly, it would be a disaster. Because if all individuals of a population look alike, it's impossible for that population to be resilient to change outside. All right, so, or that innovation can't really happen because if everything is identical, it's really hard to find solutions to, to, to environmental problems. So the way all most animals reproduce is that offspring look different than their parents because the genome in offspring is a combination of both their parents. And what that means is there's a great variation. And when you have this variation, the number of populations are far more resilient. They, they're buffered from going extinct but also they can find um, innovations faster than, than populations that don't have that diversity. So diversity is essential um, for innovation. And so, you know, in evolution, experiments and failure are, are part of the mix for finding innovation. The final point and one I wanna close it with is you're never too big or too successful to go extinct. Evolvability is essential. And obviously dinosaurs are the best example, right? They were on earth for 120 million years. And uh, they were very successful by almost every stretch of biological success in any way you want to measure it. Uh, but they disappeared very quickly uh, in, the, in the record. Now, I'm going to get into some details here because I think these details are important. And they're actually important a little bit for COVID times. And they're important for any sort of system during a period of rapid change. So this is a plot, and it's a really important plot. So what you see here is on the... On the base axis here, going, you see millions of years ago, from 600 million years ago to the present, right? From 600 to zero, we're in millions of years. And then in the, on the Y axis is extinction rate, how fast, how much extinction is happening. And what you'll notice is extinction shown in green here is a pretty common thing in the history of animals. Animals have been around for about 600 million years and extinction has always been happening in the background. Species arise, they go extinct. However, what you see here in the top I've labeled mass extinctions. There are certain periods we have peaks of extinction where extinction happens very dramatically around the world, almost simultaneously, uh, and it wipes out lots of species. In fact, the biggest extinction of all time near, wiped out nearly 95% of species that were around. 
These mass extinctions are really important. There are a small number of them, but they're global, they affect all ecosystems, and they reset the entire biosphere. Now, there's an important point here that there's a big difference between these background extinctions, which are always happening, and these catastrophes, these mass extinctions. And there are a lot of lessons we can learn from that. And this is where I wanna close. So if you look at what's important, like why do some creatures survive background extinctions and why do some creatures die? What you can do is you can see a whole list, a grab bag of traits actually, that, that make species resilient to going extinct, like during normal times. Right, so like how abundant they are, how they reproduce, how big they are. You know, you can make a long list of these things. But then you can ask the question, well, are there traits that, uh, that if help creatures survive during these catastrophes, these mass extinctions? Well, you can look at all those traits I showed you before, which are important for background extinctions. Why are these, are they important? No. None of them. You could have been the most successful animal, the most abundant animal, have the best reproductive mode and body size and all these things. None of that matters during catastrophe. So the traits that were important before the catastrophe that led to success are kind of useless during the catastrophe. And that there's other things that are happening. And that is the kind of luck of the draw almost because those kinds of traits, uh, one trait that's important I think is if creatures are dispersed around the world, they're more buffered from uh, catastrophe. But for the most part, there's um, it's sort of luck of the draw where you are at the right place at the right time. And you can think about COVID-19 and businesses and other systems and so forth. You know, you might've been the most successful restaurant business in the, you know, in the entire city of Chicago. But when COVID hit, if, unless you had the ability to have people dine outside or do takeout, you were, you know, you're going out of business. So the kinds of traits that are essential for surviving catastrophes are very different from the kind of traits that are necessary to survive in background times. Okay, so let's review. We've covered uh, billions, <laughs> millions of years here. Um, and, you know, we've closed with how you have all these wonderfully successful groups, uh, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, marine reptiles, ammonites, which were around for hundreds of millions of years. And they died in a, you know, in a, in a catastrophe. And that's the truth of many things. And we know all species are going to go extinct. What are the lessons from things like this? And I just want to close with three and then we'll uh, take your questions. What are the lessons from the past? One is the first is change is inevitable. Everything changes all the time. Our, um, the poles in the history of the Earth were you know, were rarely filled with uh, with ice. Um, the the changes we see in environments, the changes we see in species, it's inevitable. And they, all species have a beginning and a middle, middle and an end, like individuals. The thing about it is that you know the the species that survive have internal systems that allow them to innovate in a changing world, and some of those things are. Uh, are, are relate to the amount of diversity in the population. Some of them relate to how evolvable they are. And that is my, the, um, my final point here, is the most evolvable entities own the future. That is the most evolvable entities, the ones that at least in the biological world can um, survive both background extinctions as well as mass extinctions. Likewise, the most evolvable entities are the ones that um, are the ones that are not only resilient to change, but also are uh, the ones that can come up with innovation most rapidly, most effectively, and most creatively. So with that, I'll close, and I'll be love, love to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. That was a very interesting talk, and I, I wish we had more than 30 minutes to, to discuss that. Um, so three things that I would take away from your presentation would be one that evolution is about repurposing. Um, evolution is incremental. Um, small changes bring big impact. And third, evolution is about discovery. It requires patience and it requires resilience. Um, let, let's talk about, um, let's kick off the question, questioning session with um, one of my own. Um, let's talk about the journey of your discovery process. And now, I, I'm sure you knew what you were looking for, and um, you knew where to look. So you led your discovery, you said, with some educated guesses, um, what type of rock, and what type, um, and, and which, which location, which geography. Were there instances when you were wrong, or when you hit a dead end? Yes, and I think, you know, this is an important point. It was really important for me to be wrong. Um, that is, failure is an important part of what I do. And, but you know, it's not just failure, it's learning from failure. So, I mean, you have to be open to failure. Um, and there are times when I haven't found things. So what we did here is we, we identified the right kind of rock and we made a bet. And that is that rocks that were formed in ancient rivers and streams of the right age 
would be the ones that produce, um, that would be successful in producing fossils. Um, and we knew from other places that, that we had a high chance, we had a high likelihood of being successful. And we knew that we had an enormous amount of rock in the Canadian Arctic. So we had the odds on our side there. So what we decided to do at that point was just to work it, work it for a period of time, as long as the funding would keep going. And it was really about the funding at that point, because you know that you know having funders who can stick with you when you're you know failing and learning from failure, not many not many will do that always, um, particularly over six years. Um, but we were able to do that, so we had people who really stuck with us. Importantly, I also had a really great crew. Remember, I told you that. Paleontology is a team sport that, you know, I have, a, I'm, I'm really very fortunate to work with fun, really wonderful people who share the same energy uh, that I do about this and are also patient and not scared to fail. Um, so, you know, we try and, um, and, and, you know, I have to settle on certain tricks because working in the Arctic is not always easy. And we also work in the Antarctica. Um, and it can be challenging. I mean, you might have days where it's you know, minus 10 degrees centigrade and the wind is blowing 30 miles an hour and you want to be home because it's the holidays um, and you have these basic human needs uh, and you're not finding any fossils. So you have to figure out ways to keep morale going, to keep people focused. And it turns out I, I end up spending a lot of time thinking about menus and food <laughs> because that keeps people focused and it's not a trivial thing. It's actually important when you're there. Um, but no, failure is an important part of, I mean, I'm always trying and, and learning from failures, you know, and, and as I tell people, you know, you know me for my successes, you don't know me for my failures. And, um, because I've learned from my failures and I like to think that my failures have made me what I am today. Great. So, um, failure is expected, should be expected. And second, surround yourself with the right people who share the same purpose so that you all, yeah. you all keep each other going. Thank you very much. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it's very much, uh, you know, when I'm down, they'll pull me up. When they're down, I pull them up. But importantly, you want to be in a culture that um, that respects trying for things, educated guesses. Um, you know, failing, I think, is an important part. I mean, obviously, I don't want to fail all the time. But, I mean, if you're not failing, you're not innovating, right? You have to try. Um, and if you're trying to push the limits on something, it's going to be risky and it's going to be a little harder, you know, and, and that's what happened in this case too. So again, pushing the limits a little bit, taking on a little bit of risk, um, and that, that involves occasionally failure. Thank you. I'm going to hang on to that. If you're not failing, you're not innovating, and I'm going to use that to, um, with my boss sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions from the floor. Um, Okay, um, first question is, does this mean that politically, nations should not just embrace, but fiercely advocate for more diversity? For example, the USA for most parts, to design better resilience. This question is from Sharzal Sharani. Yeah, Sharzal, I would, I would agree with you. I mean, I think, I think this lesson applies in a lot of ways. I think if you, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna venture in an area where you know, many of you may be more expert than I am, so I'll you know, take it for, for what it's worth. Um, but I do think that if you have, if you have groups working on a problem, the more diversity you have, the better. And, and, and I think one of the things to avoid, and we avoid this in our own, our own field group, uh, field team when we're discussing, so we'll, in a, we'll have daily meetings, we're talking about objectives. I try to avoid groupthink as much as possible. That is, I want everybody to be able to voice their own opinion and not just to lock in on one, unless, they, unless it's the right thing. And I, but as your question suggests, and there's even a broader frame, that diversity being a substrate uh, for resilience and innovation. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think there's a, there are a number of studies that show that teams that or committees that are diverse tend to find solutions to problems much quicker than teams that aren't. Uh, they can explore face, places better. I mean, I think when, when you think about what we are as scientists and you think what we are as innovators more generally outside of science, um, you know, we're exploring a space. And, and, and exploring means the more variety you have in opinions, backgrounds, approaches, I think the more effective, more resilient, but also more in, innovative that group can be. So that's implied by your question. Yes, uh, I agree. We should fiercely advocate for more diversity. <laughs> Thank you. Second question. Four billion years of innovation has made the human body resilient. What do you reckon are the potential physiological innovations in light of the climate change in the next 50 to 100 years? Question from Idan Ismail. Yeah, so Idan, um, I, um, I think that one of the, so when you think about how we're evolving as a species, 
one of the things that have, some of the things that are affecting our evolution are not necessarily Darwinian genetic change as much as their technologies that we develop that affect our own bodies, medications, devices, and things like that that enhance human performance. That being said, when we look at climate change and we think of how the planet is changing and how our social structures are changing and so forth, you know, how is our how will how will our genome be affected by that? And it's hard to escape the fact that a couple things are going on. The first is um, we are going to be dealing with more microbial threats in the, you know, largely not only because of climate change, but also because the ways human intera humans interact with animals. Um, that, you know, I'm afraid that SARS CoV 2, COVID 19 is probably the tip of the iceberg for us. And so much of the evolution we're going to be having will not only be technical, technological in terms of vaccines, medications, and, 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 and social structures to avoid pandemics global pandemics, but also our bodies adapt to these things, our immune systems and so forth. So that's one. The other, um, when you think about how um, humans uh, or adapt or how our society adapts to climate change, one of the things we're kind of concerned about is getting back to the diversity point is one thing we're doing as societies, say here in the US with agriculture, is we're raising single species, we're raising clones of species. So um, if you go to the vast tracts of agricultural land, it's one species. So that any kind of small climate change can be catastrophic, particularly if it's related to um, water and so forth. That's not our bodies, that's our agriculture, that's a big one. But I tend to think, that when you think about what the human body will look like, say in the next hundred or even say thousand years, a lot of that would be dictated by our own technologies. A lot will be the dictated about how we can not edit genomes, maybe edit genomes, but not only that, but the kinds of devices, mind, brain interfaces, um, uh, medications and, and, and chemicals that can enhance human performance, uh, devices that can do that otherwise. So I think we're really entering a phase where technology and human biology are sort of one, right? And, and sometimes we as a species are trying to catch up to that. I mean, just look at how challenging it is for our species to adapt to the internet, to social media, to iPhones and all these things. Our brains were not sort of, did not evolve to, to deal with this kind of information. And you'll notice there's also, there's a disconnect uh, uh, between you know our our mental states and the uh, and the way we interact with each other over the internet. Just look at what happens with the recent report of eating disorders in uh, in teenage girls and, and in the ways they interact with um, with with social media, particularly Instagram, which came out. Uh, Wall Street Journal had an article on this um, last week. You know, there's a classic case of a disconnect between our bodies, our minds, which evolved in you know, Savannah Plains of Africa and the social media structure, the internet and so forth that we're dealing with. Now there's that disconnect. So we're going to be dealing with these disconnects, not just with climate change, but with our own technology as well. Thank you. Um, next question, please. Small changes, large impacts. Pressing global issues, hunger, water scarcity, food security, etc. How can a sense of urgency be imbued for such critical areas? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, the problem with our species, I mean, we have a, the, the, the wonderful thing with our, our species is that we find solutions when we have, are under pressure. Um, just think about vaccines and COVID-19. Just think about, you know, the miracle, we, the technological miracles we see when humans are forced to innovate, when we're forced to innovate. Right? Unfortunately, with your question, when you talk about pressing global issues, hunger, water scarcity, food security, and so forth, and I would include pandemic risk, at risk in that as well, um, you know, how can a sense of urgency, I'm, I'm afraid as human beings, we're really not good at... Um, a dealing with things that are out in the future, that, as, as, that are sort of, um, that appear to be um, somewhere out in the future. We, we only deal with things catastrophically, it seems. You know, so droughts, um, famines, uh, and things like that, those are the kinds of things that I think will get societies to act. Unfortunately, what happens is you have to deal with the catastrophe before we, uh, before we deal, before we can manage it. You know, one hopes, something like, say, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic will allow us to create social structures, global structures, where nations can work together to do surveillance and develop and distribute vaccines equitably and so forth. You know, you'd think that, you know, we've been living through this year and a half of COVID-19 that we'd be there already, but we're not. You know, and that doesn't lend me a whole ton of optimism. I mean, if anything, we've become a little more fragmented 
you know, we've become a little more divided from one another, which I, which I, um, which not only surprises me, but it disappoints me and indeed scares me a little bit. So, you know, when I get to your second part, you know, get to the main part of your question, how can a sense of urgency, you know, if it takes a catastrophe to do it, and even when you're facing a catastrophe, people aren't doing it, it doesn't lend one a ton of optimism. So we're going to have to be a little creative here, and I don't know what the, what the solution to that is. Thank you. Um, do we have the next question? Evolution is based on survival needs. What is the survival need that forced fishes to evolve to land animals? From Dr. Neal. Yeah, thanks. I, thank you. It's a great question because I didn't get to it in the talk. And so thank you for giving me the chance to say it. So if you look at what was going on in the, um, in the water at this time, about 365 million, 75 million years ago, there were nothing but large fish predators. There were no herbivores yet. So there were big fish about 15 feet long with teeth the size of my thumb. You had uh, fish about half that size with you know, batteries of, 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 of carnivorous teeth. Um, what you had was a highly predatory landscape in, uh, in the water at this time. It was essentially a fish-eat-fish -fish world. Uh, where the solution for you know winning this battle is either get big because big fishy little fish, get armor because that's you know, that's a good way to protect yourself, or get out of the water, get away. And it turns out getting out of the water was actually a good strategy for our distant ancestor. And the, the reason for that is, if you look at land at this time period, land had trees and shrubs and plants. It had invertebrates, had large spider-like things and invertebrates, food sources, but had no creatures walking on land that had like skeletons and our kinds of bodies. So land had all kinds of opportunities and water was loaded with danger and competition and so forth. So it's easy to see how any variation that allowed creatures to get away from the competition and predation into that opportunity would be selected for. So that's what we think. It's that constellation of opportunity on one side and hazard on the other, if you will. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay. It's from Dr. Farid Mohamedsani. The parallels between nature and human invention are appealing and seductive. However, human innovation can be evolutionary or discontinuous. Are there examples and lessons from discontinuous evolution apart from the beginning of life itself? Yeah, so, the discontin so this discontinuity is interesting because, I mean, it touches on an interesting point here because, you know, the discontinuity that you see, let's say we see a discontinuity in evolution, that could have been caused by a tiny gradual change at the genetic level. So, it's, it's, so you could have continuous change at the genetic level, but have discontinuous change at the anatomical level. So, there, so a lot of the cases where I can think of discontinuous evolution would be from having um, small changes at the genetic level that bring about big changes at the level of anatomy. So, you know, so evolution always has a continuity to it at the genetic level. It has a discontinuity at the anatomical level. And in part, you, that, you, you see that map that diff between genotype and the anatomy on one side is because sometimes small changes in genes can produce massive changes. So yeah, again, I mean, so I think, you know, in terms of heredity, it's, it's pretty much always continuous, but it needn't be continuous at the anatomical level. So yeah, there are plenty of examples of that. And you know, that fly example is one. Uh, we have some examples where you know, creatures will evolve, um, you know, new traits very quickly. I mean, within you know, a few generations, evolution can act very fast. Um, so yeah, so we see a number of those. And again, with the origin of life itself, there's kind of a lot going on there. Um, and in fact, it's gotten to the point where I think people are beginning to think about how inorganic to organic matter can happen. And there are lots of ways that that can happen. I'm not as familiar with that as I am with say fish, but there's, there's a lot of cool research, interesting research there. Thank you, Neil. We are at time. And on behalf of the Kazana Megatrends Forum, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things for us to take away and ponder on. Um, a special shout out to my bosses, Amran and Shaheen. So if I'm failing, it's because I'm innovating. <laughs> and so have a good evening, Neil. And for, to everyone else, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>